Well, welcome to week three of the My God Why course. In the last two weeks, we have been working through the problem of evil, and week one was all about saying that God is good and blank happens. Last week, if you weren't here, we talked a bit about what God is like. And this is an important question because every explanation of why is filtered by the image of God that we presuppose. So we looked at three false images about who God is and how that relates to the problem of evil. We said that God is like Jesus. God has always been exactly like Jesus. And we use the revelation of God in Christ to challenge some of those misconceptions about who God is and how that relates to the problem of evil. Today we're going to be asking the question, where did good and evil come from? Or as I've titled our talk today, Origin Story. Now before we begin in our origin story, I want to open up with yet another story of another person that's wrestled with the question, my God, why? This is Linda sharing her story. Hi, I'm Linda. I made a decision to follow Jesus as a child. I remember my dad reading John 3.16 and he inserted my name into the verse. For God so loved Linda that he gave his only son that if Linda would believe in him, she would have everlasting life. What good news for a child that was anxious and fearful. Today, I'm a wife, I'm a mom and a grandma, and in a sweet spot in life. But two years ago, my husband Ewald landed up at the Health Science Centre um, in really bad shape. They found a two-inch abscess in his liver and his body had turned septic. It took a week to confirm the abscess was a very rare and deadly bacteria that most medical practitioners had might have heard of but had never seen. Infectious disease and microbiology specialists were just astounded by his condition and basically saved his life. As if that wasn't enough, two weeks late after that, he was after he was home, our eight-year-old grandson landed up in the hospital for three days. There seemed to be swelling or inflammation in his brain and they were trying to rule out that it might have even been a stroke, they didn't know. It was terrifying again. And then about a month after that, our 11-year-old uh, granddaughter was hospitalized for three days because of multiple grand mal seizures and they were doing tests trying to rule out a brain tumor. Such a frightening experience again. Ewald was home from a, the hospital by then, but he was still recovering as well. Two days before all of these chain of events started, I had had gallbladder surgery and I would have to have corrective surgery a few months later because that inc incision herniated. There was a point in all of this where I just said to God, I can't take anymore. It's too much. And I wrestled with him. I felt myself asking God, why is it so hard to trust you, God? This felt like my worst nightmare and I remember in one of my darkest hours, a friend uh, called me and wanted to know what he could pray for. And the thought that came to me was, God, show me something tangible, anything that would remind me that you still love me and that you still care about me. And I just needed something uh, in real life that would help me keep trusting him because I couldn't understand why it was so hard for me to trust God. During that time, I also felt like my world was just out of control. Why does this feel so out of control? I remember questioning, God, are you really in control? Or is this just a cliche that we um, use when we don't know what else to say? I felt like I was in the middle of a tornado and I didn't know which way this tornado was going. Maybe it wouldn't turn out the way I hoped. Would there be recovery? If there was, how long would the recovery be? And would there be full recovery? There were so many unknowns and I asked, why does this feel so out of control? God, are you really in control? There was also a time when I realized how easy it is to be offended and feel weak and feel judgmental when you're vulnerable. 
um, I remember the specialist overseeing Ewald, he just seemed arrogant and even demeaning and condescending. I felt offended and I heard God whisper to me, Linda, guard your heart, it's the wellspring of life. Something else would come up and I would hear, Linda, guard your heart. It was pretty powerful. But then after my two grandchildren were hospitalized, I remember uh, saying back to God, I'm done guarding my heart, God. This is just too much. And I couldn't believe the very next verse I read in the Bible the next day. I've seen this verse lots, but not with this spin. It said, the peace of God will guard your heart. I didn't have to guard my heart anymore. Just accept the peace God offers. It's not just incredible, it was so powerful. There's many questions in life that I still wrestle with God on. And I just want you to know I'm a fellow struggler. There's lots I don't know. But there's one thing I do know. I do know the verse my dad gave me as a child to be true. What Jesus did on the cross for me is very real. He took upon himself my brokenness, my burdens, my fears, so that ultimately we all are made whole in him. This one thing, I know that I know. So one of my best friends in the world is Reginald Rivet. He was the best man at my wedding. I first met Reggie when he came to Lloyd Minster in 2005 for a missions program running at my home church, Lloyd Minster Gospel Fellowship. Almost immediately, he introduced me to the likes of Homestar Runner and Strong Bad, which were these really popular internet cartoons. But probably the biggest thing Reggie introduced me to was his love for comics. For Reggie, a well-spent afternoon could be spent browsing the aisle of a local comic book shop. So sometimes I would tag along and I would go look at comics with Reggie. If you have friends, you often, you end up doing what they do. Well, I discovered very early on in my brief expose into the world of comics that every good comic book character has what's called an origin story. In comic book terminology, an origin story is an account or a backstory revealing how a character gained their superpowers and the circumstances under which they became superheroes or supervillains. An origin story explains how things came to be the way that they are. So for example, we have the story of Superman. Superman's origin story is about a young child named Kal-El who escapes the planet Krypton moments before the planet is destroyed. The child is discovered by a Kansas farmer and his wife. They raise the child and call him Clark Kent. Now very early on, Clark just started to display various superhuman abilities, which upon reaching maturity, he resolved to use for the benefit of humanity through a secret Superman identity, and thus was born Superman. Another comic book hero that my friend Reggie read a lot was Spider-Man. Spider-Man's origin story goes a little like this. A young man, Peter Parker, is bitten by a radioactive or genetically modified spider. This gives the young teenager super strength, the ability to adhere to walls and ceilings, spider sense, and depending on which version of the comics you read, he can shoot web naturally out of his, like, hands, or using his skills of science, he develops a gadget that lets him fire adhesive webbing of his own design through small wrist-mounted barrels. Now, early on in the story, Peter Parker has this cataclysmic event that shapes his life. In getting these newfound powers, he actually chooses not to use them to help others. And during this one evening, he lets a criminal go when he could have easily helped. To Peter Parker's horror, he arrives home, discovered that that same criminal had ended up shooting his uncle, Ben. 
and he feels personally at fault. It is at this point, Peter Parker makes a vow to never just stand by and let crime happen. And from this point, Spider-Man is born. Now let's talk Batman. Batman's not really a superhero, unless you count the superpower of billionaire, which is barely a superhero. Basically, Batman is Elon Musk, if Elon Musk had a bit more vengeance towards crime. <laughs> Moving on. The point is, an origin story explains how things came to be the way they are. And when we talk about where good and evil have come from, the Bible has its own origin story. And that's what we're going to look at now. Now join me as we look at Genesis chapter 1, and I've invited a few people to help us read this story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let, Let there, there be, be a, a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and fruits bearing, trees bearing fruit with seeds in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God, and said, God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and the living thing with which the waters teems and that moves about in it, according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day and, and God, God said, said let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds livestock creatures that move along the ground and wild animals each according to its kind and it was so God made the wild animals according to their kinds the livestock according to their kinds and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let, Let us make mankind, mankind in our own image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and, and female, female, he created, he created them. them. God blessed them and said to them, 
be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the living creatures that moves on the ground. Then God said, I will give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food and it was so. God saw all that he made and it was very good. 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 And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So let's recap. In the beginning, the start of all things, God. And of course, what we mean by God is the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal and distinct. The God who says, let us create. The God whom John's gospel tells us, through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. God creates the heavens and the earth, day and night, water and sky, land and sea, male and female, and God creates on each of the days of creation. God begins to call creation good. And on the last day of creation, when God creates humans, the image bearers of the divine, God says that it's very good. I want to point out three things from the passage we just read as it relates to the problem of evil. And the first is that God is distinct from creation. The first four words we read in Genesis were, in the beginning, God. Before creation, before matter, there was nothing but God. God is before all things, created all things, sustains all things. God freely creates all that is. But it's important to note something here. And what we need to note is that there is actually a distinction between God and the creation God has created. Creation is not the same as the creator. Now this matters for us because if you remember last week, one of the distortions we mentioned was this concept of God as a blueprint. If you remember, this was the view that all that happens is the result of God's singular designed will. Every car crash, every cancer cell, every tsunami, every war, everything. God designs it all. Now the problem with that sort of view when we come to the text of Genesis is that it tends to forget that there is a distinction between creator and creation. It forgets that the God who is love, who created image bearers that have capacity that make decisions to have dominion and rule in creation, it forgets that. And so when we suggest that God works like a blueprint, we actually will eliminate the distinction between the creator God and the creation. And this works against the narrative of Genesis 1, where God is apart from creation and creation is apart from God. We, in theology, we call this move pantheism. Pantheism is a doctrine which identifies God with the universe or regards the universe as a manifestation of God. Now this becomes a problem when we think about the problem of evil because when we suggest that everything that happens is the result of a singular divine will, we'll end up making the move of pantheism. David Bentley Hart in his book, Doors of the Sea, which is a book he wrote about the 2004 tsunami. This is what he writes about that move. He says, unless the world is truly set apart from God and possesses a dependent but real liberty of its own, analogous to the freedom of God, everything is merely a fragment of divine volition. And God is simply the totality of all that is and all that happens. There is no creation, but only an oddly pantheistic expression of God's unadulterated power. 
So we must pay attention to the Genesis narrative and realize that creator creation distinct. And it seems that whatever it means for God to create image bearers, it means that they act apart from their creator. That everything they do is not exactly an extension of who the creator God is. The second thing I wanna point out from our Genesis passage we just read is that God is the origin of all good. This should not surprise us. God is good and all God does is goodness. God is the reason that we have something rather than nothing. God created ex nihilo, out of nothing, and so God calls forth all we know is goodness. James chapter one, verse 17 puts it like this. It says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So when you find the beauty and goodness of creation, you know it's a gift from God. The towering awesomeness of a mountain, the majestic power of a raging river, the raw power of a grizzly bear, the delicateness of a hummingbird, the beauty of a flower, are all gifts of God and expressions of God's goodness. And the third thing I would point out from this Genesis passage is that in Genesis 1, creation did not lack goodness. Which is to say, when God called creation good, God meant it. It wasn't a trick. Creation did not contain that which was not good. Augustine commented on the, comments on the Genesis passage saying, and God saw it was good by writing this. He says, We should understand that this sentence does not signify joy as if over an unexpected good, but an approval of work. God intentionally, explicitly, declaratively created goodness. In the creation account, we do not see God creating that which is not good. All that we know as the problem of evil suffering, pain, and sickness did not exist in the initial act of creation. It came from somewhere else other than God's creative act. Karl Barth puts it like this. He says, the whole realm that we term evil, sin, the devil, and hell is not God's creation, but rather what was excluded by God's creation that to which God has said no. So the question remains, if God did not create evil in Genesis 1, what then is the origin of evil? Now, before we continue reading in Genesis, let's just take a moment to define what we mean by evil. Now, it's it's tempting for us really to think that evil is a thing, something that could be created. We confess as Christians that God created the universe, so it can often seem natural to think that evil is a thing in our universe, that God must have created it, that God must have willed it. But we know God didn't. That's what Genesis 1 tells us. He saw the everything he created it and called it good. So that still leaves us asking, where did evil come from? I think a helpful corrective to our dilemma is to understand that evil is not a thing or a substance. Evil is not like Star Wars, light and dark side of the force, or like a yin or a yang. In the biblical worldview, evil is not a substance or a force, but the corruption of a good thing. Just like how Darkness is not a substance, but the absence of light. Or think about like a donut, a donut with a hole in it. You know, you look at that hole and that hole is not a donut. The hole is evil because it's the absence of donut. Evil is not something created, but the chaos of uncreation, the corruption of the good. So our, let me suggest to you, our working definition of evil is a deprivation of some good that ought to be there. So 
Where did this kind of evil come from? Where did this deprivation come from? Well, let's keep reading. Genesis 2, 8, it says, Now the Lord planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the trees of life and the trees of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat from it, you will certainly die. So recap again. God plants a garden and he places Adam in the garden. He gives one command which some of the church fathers called the first law. And that was simply this, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for if you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now notice that God is speaking to Adam as someone who is capable of choosing to eat and not eat of the tree. Adam has a choice to obey the command or disobey the command. The consequence of Adam's choice is that he will certainly die, by which I think it's best to say that the power of death, the chaos of uncreation, would enter God's good creation. Not that it was just some sort of poisonous apple and he would keel over immediately. Now this is what we call free will, the ability to make choices out of one's own will. And this is not a new thought. This is not just a clever interpretation of this. The earliest church fathers spoke about free will. For example, Gregory of Nazianus says, God gave Adam a law as a material for his will to act on. Now you may ask, why would God give Adam free will to choose not God's will? Why would God allow the possibility of evil as deprivation? Why would God consent to a world where humanity could choose to reject the author of life? By creating a, a tree of knowledge of the good and evil, isn't, doesn't that imply that God is the author of evil? And this is actually where I think it's very important to s slow down and understand why God would allow for the possibility of Adam and Eve to choose evil. And I think the, the answer is actually found in understanding a bit more about who God is. That God is, God's essence, God's nature is love. The Apostle John tells us that God is love. And it's not just like a wishy-washy love either. It's a love that's other-centered, that is fully revealed in Christ dying on the cross for sinners. It is a love that the Apostle Paul will tell us in 1 Corinthians says, does not insist on its own way. God consents to our freedom because God actually desires genuine loving relationships with humanity. Randy Alcorn, he puts it like this in his book, If God is Good. He says, God is not the author of evil. He was, however, the author of his creature's capacity to choose between good and evil. Freedom to do good, which brings good consequences, cannot exist without the corresponding freedom to do evil, which brings suffering. If loving God really means something, then the choice to follow him must be real and meaningful. Still, that may leave you with the question of what it means to say God is in control or that God is sovereign. These are things we often say. We often say like, God, God's God, got it, God's in control. And it, it kind of seems like there's a tension here between freedom and God's sovereignty. My friend Chris Green has this to say on that. This is what he writes in his book, Surprised by God. He says, sovereignty is utterly other than what we have known as control. Control makes something act in ways false to itself. It violates, overpowers, coerces, masters. Control takes away freedom, forcing someone or something to do what is against its own nature or will. And God as creator simply does not, and indeed cannot, do that kind of violence. 
God gives being to creatures, affording them their freedom, their integrity. To say that God is sovereign is to say that God does not need to control to get his will done. He does not have to control our freedom to express his own. He does not have to subjugate us to make himself known as Lord. God's sovereignty is such that his freedom is not at odds with our freedom. And his lordship does not subjugate, but frees and empowers and fulfills. Creatures overpower. God reigns. And that reign is absolutely identical with love. My friends, God does not have to be less in order for us to be all that he's called us to be. This is the tension of where evils come from. And so we need to ask, what does Adam, what do Eve do with this free will choice that God has given them? Well, let's read on in Genesis chapter 3. This is what we read. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, Your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both them, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So let's recap. There's a serpent whom the church fathers like Augustine tell us is representative of Satan, an angel who rebelled against God, but that's a whole nother topic. This serpent deceives Eve by questioning the goodness of God. Did God really say that? Eve then perpetuates her deception by sharing the fruit of the tree with Adam. And so Adam and Eve partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and their eyes are open. They realize their own nakedness. It's almost like a moment of consciousness. And something radically changes within them. They've fallen. They've given away to deprivation, to evil. And the results of this fall, as we read the origin story, become apparent. Become apparent. To summarize, the first result of the fall is, one, there's a corruption of our relationship with God. We read that when Adam and Eve's eyes are open, they become afraid. For the first time, they experience fear and shame, and this causes them to hide from God, whom they once walked with in the garden. Humanity's relationship with God has become wounded, damaged, and in need of repair. Instead of the one they should call out to for help, they hide from that God. The second thing, that is the result of the fall here is two a corruption of the natural order before the fall creation was good and after the fall we discover that cursed is the ground because of you that thorns and thistles would grow up from the ground that the pain of childbearing would become very severe and that there would be painful toil all the days of our lives 
It would seem that through Adam's moral evil, natural evil has resulted. Natural evil is the disruption of nature, of creation. That all of creation that humanity was given dominion over has fallen with humanity. Creation has been subjected to futility. This is what Romans 8 is teaching us. That creation has succumbed to the deprivation of evil. There has been a corruption to the natural order. Now as a result, Adam, who was made from the dust of creation, would now return to that dust. The power of death and all his friends have corrupted God's good creation. And so, that's our origin story today. That is the story of the origin of good and the origin of evil. But it's not the end of the story. It's only the explanation for why things are the way they are. And what I would like to leave you with today is something from within our origin story that points beyond the story. And it's found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And it's what God says to the serpent. We read, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. This verse is sometimes called the Proto-Evangelium, or pre-gospel. It's the very first thing God says in response to the fall. And what God is saying is that the seed of the woman would be the downfall of the serpent. And this is what we call a messianic prophecy, a promise that that Christ would come, a prophecy that the word would become flesh and dwell among us, a prophecy that even though humanity had fallen, even though this world is broken, that God would act and rescue us from the fall, that Jesus would crush the head of the serpent and that Jesus himself would be bruised on the cross. God's response to humanity's unfaithfulness is actually an announcement of his faithfulness. An announcement that God would not abandon us to the fall. An announcement that even though the world has gone into evil and pain and deprivation, God is now acting against that movement. So may you know today that in your darkest hour, God has a plan to work good out of evil. May you know today that evil may have its hour, but God will win the day. And may you know in this moment that God will never leave you or never forsake you.